Hey hey hey, so once again this week we have a lot of linguistic references to cover as well as some great character moments from some of the Straw Hats, so let's get straight into covering all these elements that you might have missed reading the chapter. To start things off, the woman Black Maria talks to at the start of the chapter is confirmed to be a small user called Kaiman Lady. This seems to indicate this is the naming convention for the female gifters, who instead of having man at the end, like mouse man, batman or gazelle man, they instead have lady at the end. Black Maria refers to her spider webs as hard gum, likely referring to them being sticky and malleable like chewing gum, but being quite hard and resistant. However, the kanji reading for hard gum reads as my threads, as these are all threads of cobweb that are produced from her Delford powers. One of the ladies reacting at Sandy's call for help extends her tongue far in shock, though she extends it way farther than anyone else would do. This is because she's based off of the Shitanagauba, a yokai of Japanese folklore known for having a very long tongue. So it makes sense Oda would appear her reacting with her tongue stretching longer than any other person. Also, the yokai girls refer to Black Maria not by her name or with a title, but as Nesan or Big Sister, which fits the Big Sister persona that Black Maria has. In that regard, we also see Black Maria referring to her pets as little boys, despite the fact that she's really only 21 years old and she might even be younger than some of them, but she looks down on others as a big sister, quite literally even given her height, since it fits her dominating personality. Sanji is rescued in the nick of time by Robin, who uses an attack called Gigantes Comano Spunk. Gigantes Comano is Spanish for gigantic hand, though it is technically written grammatically incorrect, because it uses a male adjective for a female word and uses the Japanese order for adjective object rather than the Spanish order of object adjective. In correct Spanish, it should be Mano Gigantesca. By the way, the kanji reading for this attack is Gigantic Tree. Because while her normal arms sprouting are like flowers, these gigantic arms are more like trees. When Robin enters the room, she tells Black Maria that I've spent so long working in evil organizations that when seeing such a horrible thing done to a friend, which in this case is in Japanese the word Nakama, it comes out the devil part in me. Now this is both on one hand an obvious reference to Robin's epithet, Devil's Child. The original Japanese term is Akuma no Ko, which can be translated as Child of the Devil, or Child of the Devils, since Japanese doesn't distinguish uh, between singular and plural, or simply as Devil Child, since this is referring to how the people of Hara were called devils due to attempting to research the true history. And in this case, Robin uses it as a callback to Mark Black Maria, which is reflected in the title of the chapter. However, the reference goes even deeper, because Robin's line of seeing such a horrible thing done to a friend, or hidoi koto saretara in Japanese, is actually a reference to an iconic catchphrase of hers, what a horrible thing to do, or hidoi koto suru wa. This is a line she used, for example, in her battle against Yama, as well as other instances in the series, and is being brought back here once again in a very, very subtle reference. Hidoi koto suru wa? In response to having cut Black Maria's threads with his eyes, Brooke jokingly comments about he and Black Maria that it seems like we were a good match, as a way to taunt her. This is ironic because it's not just a way to tauntingly flirt with her, but it's also because this means that Brooke is a good matchup as her opponent. In the next scene, Yamato explains that the animals seen running around the castle are cyborgs, with the kanji reading for the word cyborg being mechanical animals. These animals, he says, are a part of the reconnaissance unit called the Marys, which follow the linguistic pattern that all of Kaido's units have of ending with a Z sound. Waiters, pleasures, gifters, and Marys. But why Mary? Well, this is, as you might expect, a pun, because Mary, when read in Japanese, sounds like Meari, which can also be read as Meari, or has an eye. Back to Black Maria, she turns her back to Robin and Brooke and takes off her kimono to show a tattoo on her back, which features the kanji Jonan. Jonan is a word that represents the misfortune a woman can bring onto a man, usually referring to when women abuse their sex appeal to ensnare men and use them to their own advantage. 
This makes sense for someone like Black Maria, who, just like a spider, she lures men and ensnares them, making use of her sex appeal to trap them. Also, by the way, her weapon appears to be a long staff with a flaming wheel attached at the end. This is in fact a Wa Nudo, which literally translates to Wheel Priest. A yokai then manifests itself in the form of a bald man's head stuck inside a wheel covered in flames. The Wa Nudo is depicted with a shaved head like that of a monk or a priest because they are said to be an incarnation of men who have sinned in their past life, forced to now work in penance to redeem their sins. Though so far it's yet to be clarified if this is some sort of living creature, like a user or something, or if this is just a face sculpted onto her weapon. And finally, to close off the chapter, Black Maria tells Robin that she's going to belong to Kaido by the end of all of this. However, Robin replies that she'd rather be dead than end up that way. This is a beautiful callback to the iconic scene in his lobby when she said that she wanted to leave, because in this case she's indicated that her condition for wanting to leave is being able to do so alongside her friends. If she's ripped apart from her friends, then she'd rather die, because there is no point in wanting to leave. And, as she says this, the panel pans over to Brooke, who, unlike her, is not someone who would rather be dead, because he already is dead. Yo -ho -ho. So while those are the linguistic references in this chapter, I wanted to also take this opportunity to talk about a very important element of this chapter, and that is Sanji's call for help for Robin, because I feel that it's a scene that is very easy to misunderstand, so I wanted to share my own interpretation of it. While, from an outsider's perspective, Sanji's plea for help might sound like a pathetic display, that of a weak man who can even protect himself to the point that he has to ask a woman to dive into a trap to help him out, just like how we see the kid pirates criticize him, this is in fact a great moment of character development for Sanji. Something that Oda really drove home during Whole Cake Island is how Sanji kept finding himself unable to ask for help. He kept running away and away and away, and sacrificing himself in an attempt to protect those dear to him. And while you can't argue if this was executed properly or not, it showed a lot of the insecurities that tormented Sanji due to his troubled upbringing, and how in spite of being a very strong man, capable of defeating powerful foes, he's also someone who possesses emotional weaknesses and insecurities. Sanji struggled with how powerless he felt against his family and the influence of one of the Yonko, because while it takes a lot of strength to be powerful and stand up to others, it equally as much takes a lot of strength to accept that you are weak and to ask for help. Especially when you are in such a hard spot. If you've been there yourself, you can definitely understand what I mean. I've been there and I understand just how hard it can feel to be able to rely on others. In that way, Sanji struggled that much across Whole Cake Island to rely on Luffy. This isn't because he didn't trust him, but because he was so deep in his own self-doubt that he legitimately believed Luffy was better off with someone else than him. Which is why, when he meets up again with Luffy later in that arc, and Luffy asks him what it is he truly wants, with Sanji saying he wants to go back to the sunny, Luffy praises him for finally acknowledging his weakness and being willing to rely on his friends, because it's at that point that Sanji finally learned to ask for help. And that's precisely why a scene like the one in this chapter is so fundamentally important. Because Sanji is willing to admit that he has a weakness. He is willing to admit he can't do anything here, and that he's simply unmatched due to his own principles and his unwillingness to hurt women. And it's also important to say that this is not inherently a bad thing, it's just a trait of who he is. Like Sanji said in his lobby to Usopp, I'll do what you can do, and you do what I can do. He couldn't fight Khalifa, but he could do what Usopp couldn't do and fight Jabra. The same applies here. We all have strengths and weaknesses, but it's by relying on others that we can make the most of our strengths and make up for our weaknesses. This is something the series has shown so clearly, and it brings once again the emphasis that it's important to have people to rely on, because you cannot do everything by yourself. That's why friends are important. The fact that here Sanji is willing to rely on other people, even the woman he usually tries so hard to protect, shows that he has learned to really trust his friends and to believe in them. To not always have to act as the brave gentleman or the strongest in the crew, but as someone who can acknowledge that it's fine to be weak at times. Some might easily dismiss this by claiming that they want to see Sanji being strong and powerful, and don't get me wrong, I hope he gets a great fight later in this arc to show his strength too. But I think there's also beauty to see characters not just when they are their strongest, but also when they are their weakest. Because it's when one is at their weakest that they have to be their strongest. <laughs> 